I had an amazing childhood growing up. I was raised by a hardworking single mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> On the weekends, she would take me to the hotel where she worked, and I got to play around, swim in the pool, eat that fancy hotel food. You know? Unfortunately, this wouldn't last very long. When I was about seven years old, my mom sat me down, told me she was going to the UK for work. At that age, I couldn't really comprehend that. I was seven years after all, right? And I thought she was abandoning me. It wasn't until I got to my mid-twenties that I understood why she had left. She had migrated to the UK in search of a better life for both me and her. In my mid-twenties, I was in a really bad place, financially, mentally. I was struggling with all sorts of things. I was battling all sorts of demons. And all I wanted to do was just get out of that environment and start over. I had a friend who was working in Dubai at the time. He had known me ever since I was about this tall, really young. We met during his vacation, and during the intervention, which it was, he introduced me to the idea of migration. He had a stable income, he had savings in the bank, he took care of his mom, he, he was living abroad, basically everything that I wanted. Right? So it, he urged me to try it out, so I did. The following week, we went to a recruitment agency that sends migrant workers to the Gulf. I was in no position to choose jobs, as I really hadn't performed well in school. The only job options available were minimum wage, security, cleaning, gardening, construction. I said I'd take the first one that came along, which just happened to be security. The salary was $400. This was more money than I ever thought I'd earn, right? But I had to pay about $1,200 to facilitate the whole process. This was illegal, and, and two, I didn't have $1,200. Luckily, my mom came to the rescue and you know, paid everything, and on January 2016, I flew out and told myself I'm never coming back. Now, I've worked in Qatar for about four years, give or take, under two different companies. The first company, things were good, normal. Wages, living conditions, working conditions, everything was pretty much compliant with the law. The second company, this is where things get interesting, okay? We arrive in Qatar, our passports are taken, which is illegal. The working hours, they are longer than stated in the original contract. The living conditions, goodness. Imagine living six, eight, 10, 12 people in one tiny room. It was pretty cramped. We had bed bugs everywhere. There was mold on the wall everywhere. It was atrocious conditions, really. Bathrooms, toilets, they were unsanitary. And the food was appalling. People even got sick because of this company provided food. So I said I'd do something about it. Not because I was brave. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. It was because I'd had enough. There's only so much a person can take, right? So for context, our company provided security for Msherib downtown Doha. Smart, sustainable city, da da da. Msherib downtown Doha is or was the flagship project of Msherib Properties. Msherib Properties is a subsidiary of Qatar Foundation, yes, the one and only. Qatar Foundation has this mandatory welfare standards that dictate the living conditions, the working conditions, and even recruitment of migrant workers. So I did some digging and found that none of these conditions were being implemented in our company. So I wrote an anonymous letter to Mshere Properties, Qatar Foundation, the Ministry of Labor, and even the Ministry of Interior, but to no avail. It was never my intention to, to go public, right? I was working from behind the shadows using an anonymous you know, name and all that. Never my intention to go public. But seeing as how these institutions basically did nothing you know, in light of these conditions, I reached out to migrantrights.org, and they helped me write an article where I described the injustices and the various stories of individual guards. The article got a lot of traction, unbelievably, right? Our company was forced to implement some of these welfare standards and changes to our living conditions. This was unprecedented. Something like this had never happened before. So it was a, a victory, right? You know, light bulb moment. 
So you mean to tell me that all I needed to do for things to change is just to write? To express myself? Roger that. So Migrant tried to give me a platform where I would blog about various topics, and I also had my Twitter and Instagram where I would post regularly. Allow me to introduce you to Sheikha Moza bint Nasser, Her Highness. According to the internet, she is a humanitarian who is also responsible for major reforms in education and women's rights in Qatar. She also happens to be the mother to the king, or the emir, by the way. So how does she fall into all this story? Well, it was the summer of 2020. She happens to have an office in the same place that I work, that is Mshave downtown Doha. She visits this office once a week. So one day, 10 a.m., she pulls up in a long Bentley, right? Maroon in color, never forget that. She sees security guards will be made to stand outside since morning. For those of you who are not aware, it gets really hot in Qatar. Temperatures exceeding 50 degrees, you're talking humidity off the charts, right? It gets so hot that the government actually prohibits anyone from walking outside from around 10 a.m. to around 3 p.m. So it's basically legal, yet here we are. She sees the security guards, does nothing to address the issue. As the chairperson and co-founder of Qatar Foundation, as a humanitarian, as an individual with substantial influence, the least she could have done is just notify the relevant department, but she didn't. This goes on for the rest of the summer, and no one does anything about anything. Fast forward to the next year, this is March 2021, right before summer, and I knew we were going to have a repeat of what happened in the previous year, so I said I'm going to do something about it. Again, not because I'm brave, but because it was necessary, okay? So I write an article detailing what happened the previous year, and I follow it up with an Instagram series on the stories of individual guards within the property. This got substantial traction, and as a result, we had some changes. Security guards were no longer made to stand outside during these wicked temperature times, and they were given regular breaks, they were given drinking water, none of which was available in the previous year. It was a victory, again. A small victory, but a victory nonetheless. About a month later, on May 4th, I got arrested by the State Security Bureau, or the SSB. They told me I wasn't entitled to legal counsel. They placed me in, in solitary confinement. So it was four weeks of interrogation, blindfolds, handcuffs trips back and forth in blacked out SUVs to the public prosecution without a lawyer. Psychological tactics, disorientation, you name it, right? I was made to sign a confession in Arabic, basically stating that I had received money from foreign agents with the intent to spread disinformation in the state of Qatar. Yeah, that's a mouthful, but all it really means is I was being charged under the Espionage Act which is a really, really bad thing to be charged with in any of those Gulf countries, right? Fortunately, my disappearance prompted international outcry. Students from Qatar Foundation, together with alumni, faculty, and staff, they wrote a letter calling for my release. This, honestly, was the best thing that happened during this period. To all those students, faculty, staff, alumni from Qatar Foundation, thank you. A civil society group stepped in and provided a lawyer, and through negotiations, the espionage charge was taken off the table, right? But I wasn't still allowed to leave the country. I had to pay a fine, I had to pay a fine of about $6,800, you know, then I was free to leave. No? Now, moving forward, together with all those experiences, right, we would like to focus on an issue that isn't really talked about, and this is the reintegration of migrant workers back to society. After my ordeal, I was fortunate to have not one, but multiple organizations support me. I was picked up at the airport. I was offered 
a living arrangement. They offered counseling. I even got a six-month consultancy with a certain NGO. Most migrant workers don't have that. I have a vision of, of this center, a center for migrant worker welfare, a center where other migrant workers who've been exposed to traumatic experiences could also be afforded the same courtesy. And through partnerships with various institutions, we could offer training in various fields, various trades, so that they could become employed or self-employed. Last year, during the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, the world was introduced to the sad reality, the harsh reality of migrant workers in the Gulf. Modern slavery, human trafficking, forced labor, the deaths. There were calls for boycott, and a lot of you wanted to know how you can help. It's not enough to write articles. It's not enough to write those reports. It's not enough to shoot documentaries. We need to do more. Here's what more looks like. Airplane tickets cost money. The living arrangement costs money. Research, counseling, medical care, all of this costs money. We need funding for this. We need pro bono legal assistance. We need digital security and tech support to coordinate these operations. Right? With such a system in place, with such a center in place, we show that there is hope for life after migration. Thank you.